Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Okay, praise y'all. Thank you, Isha. Thank you, Bathama, for filling in for those time. Praise the Most High Yahweh. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Most High Yah, we're giving you thanks and praise and the honor and the glory, though we come short even of doing that. We ask that your spirit, your spirit of righteousness and truth would guide and direct our paths, that your name, your name alone, be uplifted and honored. Given glory in the name of the Messiah, how shall we pray? Amen. Praise Yah. Okay, so brothers and sisters, we we're gonna let's get right into the word. We we started off last time talking about how the uh, the faith of the Messiah is the Father's righteousness, and I want to begin there as we're getting ready to get right into Zechariah this time. But I, I want to begin there. Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. I'm going to start at verse 8 and read verse 8 and 9. Revela uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, which is kind of a synopsis of what we've already studied. What we already studied last time, we our last time, part 2. This is part 3 of Yah's scattered chosen, the scattered chosen. Okay, notice what it says. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Messiah, Yahweh my master, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Messiah, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Messiah, the righteousness of Yahweh by faith. I want to stress here, when the apostle is talking about the law, he's not talking about the law given by Moses. I want to make sure you understand that. He's talking about the law given through scribes and Pharisees. Testing one, two, three. You want to, you hear what I'm saying? So he's talking about the law given through scribes. In fact, he mentions the fact that he was a Pharisee. So the Pharisees had added to the law of the Most High. They had taken away from the law of the Most High. And we know from our study of the word, we know, in fact, let's take a look at it. Deuteronomy, the book of the law, the book of the law, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter, chapter four, Deuteronomy chapter four, indeed, Deuteronomy chapter four, that's right, Deuteronomy chapter four, verse one and two. Notice Deuteronomy chapter four, verse one and two. I want to point these things out before we get into Zechariah. We have went through a lot. As you know, sometimes I overdo the preparation, but I'd rather be overdoing the preparation than underdoing it. Praise the Most High, Yah, that you might be prepared as we go into Zechariah. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which Yahweh, Most High of your fathers, giveth you. Notice. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your Most High, which I command you. Listen, brothers and sisters, when the scribes and Pharisees added to his word, it was no longer his word. When they added and taken away from his law, it was no longer his law. So when the, when, when the apostle mentioned that he was a Pharisee and that he was blameless according to that law, it was their law. Testing one, two, three. He wasn't counting the law of Yah as dung. As a matter of fact, by the power of Yah's spirit, as we've been reading all through the scriptures and many witnesses, it's by his spirit that we obey his law. And so we say, brothers and sisters, when the Mormons come to you with a book of Mormon, you can know without even looking at the book. You can know right now that's not his law. Testing one, two, three, you catching me? When they come with this book and it's not the Bible and it's not the law of the most high, you can know right now. You don't have to ask any other questions. That's it. Done. That's not his law. When the Seventh-day Adventists come to you with Ellen White's books, you can know right now it's not the law. Why? When you add to or take, listen, you don't, need to, you don't need nothing but the word. 
when you add to and take it away, when you when you add something to it now, you just messed it up. When the Jehovah Witness is coming to you with Watchtower, you don't even have to read it. You can know right now it's not his law. Testing one, two, three, you following me? See, some things you don't even have to look at. When they come into you with this thing, by principle, you already know. By principle, by principle, you already know. He says, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish art from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh. When I was in the SDA church and I was on the church boards, I was on many church boards, many church boards, and they used to follow this book called the Church Manual. It used to bother me. I didn't understand until later why. It, it used to bother me that they followed this book called the Church Manual. It bothered me, man. I, I just didn't understand it. I actually verbalized and people would snicker and laugh. I would say, why are we just looking at the Bible? Why are we just looking at the Bible set? And he had this church manual. But now, as I'm now out of that apostate organization, and I'm now in the Father's spirit looking at his word, I can see very clearly. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither ye shall ye diminish aught from it. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. The word which Yah has given us for these last days contains within it the answers to every single question you may have. Without exception. The only issue is, can you find it? That's the only issue. It's not the issue whether it's there or not. Everything that has to do with human beings interacting with each other is in the pages of this book from Genesis to Revelation. It's there. Only question, do you want to go search for it or don't you? But I would think it would take less effort to search the word for answers than to just go create a whole nother book. Huh? I would think it would take less effort to go search the word than to go through the trouble of publishing a whole nother book. But that's what they did. So when the apostle Paul talking about, I count all these things but dung, he is not dealing with what we're dealing with here, the word that was commanded in the book of the law. He's not dealing with that. He's not counting that but done. Wait a minute. You're trying to tell me that Yah's law, which is written by his own finger on tables of stone, is done? Do you think, do you really think the apostle Paul would actually say that? Do you? <laughs> now listen, like I said, man, there's some fools out here that'll believe anything. So I shouldn't be surprised, okay? So there's some fools out here that'll believe anything. So all right, but we who are Israelites, who are followers of the only true God, the creator, Yah, who is the only God that only revealed himself to us as Israelites, above all other people, we know that his law is not dumb. So when the apostle said, I count everything but dumb that I may win Christ, what he's trying to say is Messiah is the only thing that we need to win in order to be obedient to all Father's commandments because Messiah, again, is the representation of the Father's righteousness. Yahawashai, the son of Yahweh Sadak. Yahawashai, Yah exists to save the son of Yah's righteousness. That's all we need. We need the son of Yah's righteousness. If we win Messiah, we can get the whole thing. But that does not, obviously, does not do away with the Father's law. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself said in the epistle that we just studied in Romans, he said, yea, we establish the law. We establish it. Because the foundation is the rock, which is Messiah who represents Father. We establish the law. Okay? So I want to get that straight off the bat. But in that narrative that we just read, he said, Yah, Yah's righteousness, the faith of your Messiah is Yah's righteousness. We need to understand what that, how deep that is. So in other words, the faith of the Messiah is a witness of the Father's righteousness. Okay, let me say that again. I, I don't want to talk too fast. I, I'm originally from New York, and sometimes that messes up because I end up talking too fast, and that is not good. I'm not being joking either. I'm being serious. So I try, let me speak more deliberately so people can hear me because it's important. 
The faith of Messiah is the bearing witness of Father's righteousness. Did y'all hear that? The faith of Messiah is the bearing witness of Father's righteousness. Okay? That's the faith of Messiah. So all of us are seeking to be partakers of the faith of Messiah because by the faith of Messiah, we are overcoming all sin. By the faith of Messiah, we overcome all sin. Again, I, I can't help myself. I got to warm up before we get to Zechariah. I know I warmed y'all up enough last time. We're not going to go in as depth a warm up this time, but I, did, I do need a little bit. Please bear with me. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation 14, 12. Notice what it says. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Yahweh and the faith of Yahweh Shah. I'm glad they didn't mess that up in that restored name version. I'm so glad they didn't mess that up because that, that shows me it's legit because this is one of the legit verses. All, every single last one. Listen carefully. I dare anybody. Tell me I'm wrong and show me. Every single last one of the other translations messes this verse right up. They change it to faith in Yahweh Shah. You done messed up right there. You done messed up. The pages of the saints, they that keep Yah's commandments and the faith of Yahweh Shah. The faith of Messiah is to bear witness of the Father's righteousness, which you can only bear witness of the Father's righteousness by his spirit. So we obey his commandments basically by his spirit. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? I'm just breaking it down very simply. But you only obey his commandments by his spirit. You cannot obey his commandments in any way which he accepts, except it be by his spirit. If you seek to, to obey his commandments in your flesh, you are living a very harsh life. You find people that do that to be very exacting, very judgmental. Am I correct? People that try to obey the commandments without the spirit of Yah are very judgmental. They're very exacting. They're very unforgiving. And they are, of course, above all things, most misrepresentation, the most misrepresentative of the father. Okay, misrepresentative. The Father is love and righteousness and his spirit causes us to obey him. It is not without his spirit that we obey him. Without his spirit, we become empty vessels of, of, of a righteousness by works of religion. And then you might as well be Catholic. You might as well be Mormon. You might as well be SDA. You might as well be Muslim because all of those are without his spirit. All of those create their own brand of righteousness without the Father's spirit. Every last one of them. That's what makes us different. One of the many things that makes us different. All of our obedience comes through the Father's spirit of righteousness. Here, they that keep the commandments of Yah, how do they do it? By the faith of Messiah. That is the Father's spirit of righteousness. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17. I'm about to break this down. Revelation 12, 17. Notice what it says in Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman which went to make and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yahweh and have the testimony of Yahweh Shai, the Messiah. Let's break this down. The dragon is the devil. He was enraged at the woman. The woman, listen carefully, is the nation of Israel. I want to say that three times for emphasis. The woman is the nation of Israel. The woman is the nation of Israel. The woman is the chosen seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the woman. He was wroth with her. And he went to make war with her seed. Why would he have to do that? Because what? Her seed was scattered. Correct? You've already you studied that, right? Her seed was scattered because of our sins and the sins of our fathers. So he went to go make war with them wherever they are. He wants to destroy them. That's why I say to you, and looking in the carnal, he wants to kill every black male. 
Why does he want to kill every black male? Because the black males are a representation of that woman's seed. And he don't want to take no chances. He wants to kill them all. Kill all the males. Just like Pharaoh. This is not new. Pharaoh said, if it's a male, throw it in the river. That's what Pharaoh said. It's a female, keep it alive. If it's a male, throw it in the river. Brothers and sisters, they've been throwing the males in the river ever since. And if you ain't got that, I can't say nothing for you. I can't tell you nothing. If you ain't understood that, I can't tell you nothing. Okay? If you don't want to believe that, keep going because I can't say nothing to you. Okay? They've been throwing the males in the river ever since. What you think they got Planned Parenthood for? Planned Parenthood is not for Caucasian women. Planned Parenthood is to kill black babies. Margaret Sanger invented Planned Parenthood to kill black babies, specifically black males. Specifically black males. Why? Because it's in the male. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand the man is not made. The man is made in the image of Yahweh. The woman is made in the image of the man. He made Adam as a male with a penis in his own image. And then he took and he opened up the rib and he made a woman from Adam's rib with a vagina. I'm trying to be playing for y'all. I'm not sugarcoating this. You know me. The man is in the image of Yah. The woman is in the image of the man. So obviously, Asatan wants to kill all the males. It's very simple. See, people try to turn it into women's lab and women's liberation and movement and now and all that. Man, don't get caught up in that. That stuff was for Caucasian women with her argument against the Caucasian man. They're trying to use it to trap our people. Don't get caught up in it. Don't get caught up in it. You heard me? Don't get caught up in it. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Listen, listen, man. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I may sound harsh. And, and please forgive me. I'm not trying to sound harsh. I'm just trying to bring the truth as straight as possible. That's all. I really, really. I'm not trying to make enemies, although I make enemies. I'm not trying to make enemies. I'm not. But the Father's glory is all I care about. You want to be my enemy? I don't, I don't care. Because the Father's glory is all I care about. I don't care other than that. Honestly. Money, poverty, whatever. I don't care. Okay? I'm just trying to be honest with you. So the woman is the seed of Israel. Is the nation of Israel. The seed is particularly the black male. And the dragon wants to destroy him. Especially as he is now awakening to keep the commandments of Yah. And how is he keeping them? The testimony of the Messiah. The word, listen carefully now. The word testimony is the word witness. It's the word, it's the word Greek word from which you get martyr. Okay, one that's given their life for a cause. It's the, it's the witness of Messiah. Messiah's witness, as we very well know, but I, it bears repeating hundreds of times. Messiah's witness is a witness of the Father's righteousness. Messiah's witness is a witness of the Father's righteousness. Let me say it again. I'm, I don't care if it sounds crazy. The Messiah, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the witness of the Father's righteousness. You can only bear witness of the Father's righteousness by the power of his perfectly righteous spirit. So therefore, the people that are being led in this last days, look for the black males, Spanish males, black males, Malaysian males, Indonesian males, males of color. Spread all over this earth, brothers and sisters. Males of color spread all over this earth. And the children of the males of color spread all over this earth. Because that's who's being risen up right now. To bear witness of the perfect righteousness of the Father. That's the testimony of Messiah. And so listen. You don't get to prophecy anything. Nobody does unless you get it from Messiah's witness, which is his father's righteousness. Are you following me? Which brings us to Revelation chapter 19. It brings us to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. 
Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Watch very closely. Revelation 19 and verse 10. Okay, watch closely now. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of, I'm going to say it just as I say it, the testimony of Jesus, or the testimony of Yahweh Shah. Worship Yahweh, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? The witness of Messiah, which is the Father's righteousness, gives forth the spirit of the Father, which brings forth what? Prophecy. Because all prophecy comes from the Father. Remember Revelation chapter 1, verse 1? The revelation of Messiah, which Yah gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Remember that? So Father is the origin of all prophecy. And the bear witness of his righteousness is the spirit by which you get the opportunity or the ability to prophecy, which is why it says the testimony of Yahweh Shah is the spirit of prophecy. Unfortunately, the SDA church has brought forth a lie to say that Ellen White is the spirit of prophecy. That is a lie, a lie from the pit of hell, unfortunately. Ellen White is not the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the witness of Messiah, which is the Father's spirit of perfect righteousness. Any individual generally would be a black male that is going to receive that spirit of perfect righteousness, is going to receive the ability to prophecy. Prophecy comes from the Father. We have been looking at this When we studied just now Haggai, when we studied just now, we looked at Ezra, remember? And it said, it said, Ezra, the, it said, the Most High stirred up the spirit of Haggai, stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, stirred up the spirit of Zechariah, stirred up the spirit of Yahweh the son of Yahweh Sadat, right? That is his spirit working in those men for the blessing of his people. And that's what he said. I am thy fellow servant and of thy Brethren, who is Joshua? Who is Yaconan's brethren? The Israelite people. The Israelite nation. That's his brethren. I am of thy brethren. I'm of the nation that had this testimony of Yahweh. Worship him, don't worship me. Gabriel trying to tell him. For this test, the witness of the Messiah is the spirit of prophecy. So when you see testimony of Jesus, think. Witness of Messiah, which is righteousness of Father. Faith of Messiah is righteousness of Father. It's not two different things. It's the same thing. It's just two different ways of saying. That's what people get confused. Father sometimes uses different ways of saying the same thing. So when he says, he that keep the commandments of Yah and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, what he's saying is, he that keep the commandments of the Most High by the spirit of Father's righteousness. When he say, the word dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Yah and have the testimony of Yahweh Shah. What he's saying is, this is those that obey Yah's commandments, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the spirit of Father's righteousness. The angel told John, don't worship me, worship Yah. I am of your brethren that have this testimony or the bear witness of the faith of Messiah. Worship Yah, for the witness of Messiah is the spirit of prophecy. Y'all got all that? So as we're getting ready to look now at Zechariah, and I'm going to go through it now. So now we went through a lot of background just to get ready to go through chapter one. And that's not unusual. Y'all know when we did Daniel, when we did Revelation, when we did Ezekiel, we go through a lot of background, don't we? We go through a lot of background to get prepared because as we get go, we start going through this thing, we want to be on, on point as to what we're talking about. So Zechariah is of those brethren that Gabriel's talking about. They have the testimony of the Messiah. They have the spirit of prophecy. They bear witness of the faith of Messiah, which is the Father's righteousness. Brothers and sisters, let me just break this down to the very simplest root that I can. Asatan is the accuser of the brethren. 
Asatan, being the accuser of the brethren, is a really accusing father of sin. Asatan is trying to claim father is a hypocrite. Father's righteousness declares he is not only not a hypocrite, but he's perfect in character. Okay, that's the war that's being waged right now. There are people on the spiritual side, I'm saying, there are people that are not understanding Father's righteousness is perfect. And then there are those that try to act like they can philosophize, figure out, claim Father's righteousness and doubt it. To say that Father's righteousness is not perfect is blasphemy to us. That's why we read earlier, again, we talked about Deuteronomy, remember we talked about his way, he is the rock, his way is perfect, he is perfect in judgment and fairness and righteousness, he has no blemish, Father. And so that's why we understand that, that's why the issues about this, this war, this war of the spirit that's raging on the earth, and it's more powerful than any physical war, the war of the spirit that is raging is a war between Asatan's accusations about the Father and the Father's perfect righteousness as represented in his grace Messiah and in his law. So this is all about vindication of Father's righteousness. That is why those of us that belong to Father, our whole goal in life is to vindicate Father's righteousness to bring him honor and glory. And we already know we can only bring him honor and glory as we are obedient. And we are only obedient unless we receive his spirit. I'm just breaking up. This is, this is the backdrop upon which we about to dive right into Zechariah. But I'm just giving you this backdrop because it's obviously it's extremely important. And you cannot, over, I cannot overestimate, I cannot overemphasize this point. It's impossible to overemphasize, which is why I bring it up as often as I will. Messiah's life is about a bearing of witness of the Father's righteousness. Messiah as our high priest, Yahweh, Yahweh Shah, meaning Yah exists to save, the son of Yahweh Sadak, which means the son of Yah's righteousness. It is through him we receive the spirit of the Father by which we become obedient to the Father and bear witness of his righteousness to the earth, even upon death, even if it means we die. That's why money doesn't matter. Fame doesn't matter. Property doesn't matter. Brothers and sisters, nothing matters as long as we have the Father's righteousness. That's all that's matter. And that's why we have to, we overcome all of Satan's tools. We overcome Satan's tool of trying to think we're going to be gods. We humble ourselves and let the most high be God. We overcome Satan's tools and his fear of death because he's going to be destroyed. You know how he's going to be destroyed? Because we who belong to Father will have overcome our fear of death. We're not worried about death. Praise Yah. We're not going to be begging you, please save me. Don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Man, go ahead. Do what you got to do. That's what we say. Do what you do. We're not scared. Whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever, whatever. My only fear is to be outside Father's will. That's my only fear. Really, that's all. My only fear is to be outside of Father's will. I love my children. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna get real. I'm gonna get real with you right now. I'm gonna get real 100, more 100 than you probably heard. I'm not bragging to say that. I'm saying that just to prepare you what's about to come off this microphone. Okay? If they lined up all my children in front of me and shot them all in the head, I wouldn't turn from the Father. If they lined up my grandchildren in front of me and shot them all in the head, I wouldn't turn from the father. You could not move me from the father. You could take me apart limb by limb. You could skin, you could skin me alive. I'm staying with the father. And you know I can say that. The reason I can say that is because I believe with all my heart that his grace is more powerful than my will, than everything. His grace is so powerful, he can cause me to overcome all. There's nothing on this earth I wouldn't sacrifice for the Father. And I'm not a perfect servant. Don't get me wrong now. Don't get it twisted. I'm a sinner just like y'all. But I'm telling you where my heart is. 
There's nothing you could do, nothing you could take, nothing you can offer me. There's no billion dollars you can offer me. There's no pretty women. There's nothing you could do that's worth more to me than the father. That's what makes me dangerous. That's what makes me dangerous. Nobody in the earth heard of me. You understand? Nobody in the earth heard of me. I'm not famous, but Asatan knows who I am. He knows very well who I am. Cause he, cause, and why? Because he knows what I just said is true. It's the same with all y'all. He know what I just said is true. And that sounds hard. But brothers and sisters, it, it's got to get there. It's got to get to that point. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating this mess for you. They're gonna take people out of houses, they're gonna kill your family in front of you. They're gonna do all kinds of things to you. This is no joke. What you think? When we talk about Job, what you think? Job went and he said, um, the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. That which I was afraid of is happening to me. I was not in rest, neither was I, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. What is he saying by that? The thing Job feared above all was his death of his children. He went out every day and offered sacrifice for each of his 10 children, his seven sons and his three daughters. He offered sacrifice every day because he said, it may be that my children have sinned in their hearts. So he, he offered, he was, and look what happened. The Most High smote all 10 of his children. That's what hurt him. That's what hurt him. It wasn't the, the blast that was on his skin. It wasn't losing all his property. Job wasn't worried about that. You heard what he said. Naked came out from the womb. Naked I returned. Yahweh gave and Yahweh taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. He wouldn't worry about that. It was his children. And if you read through Job carefully, most people do not. But if you read through Job carefully, his three friends kept mentioning his children. Well, if your children have sinned, he take them away because of their sin. Well, you can't, you know, you got to you know, admit it, your children sin. He was hurt because of his children, as anybody would be. No parent, right? No parent worth they sought want to outlive their children. No, all of us want to die before our children. That's the honest truth about it. I mean, if you got any kind of care at all for your children, you want to die before your children. You don't want to outlive your children now. You don't want to be putting your children in a grave. Though many of us have had to, unfortunately. And Job outlived his 10 children. And there's no replacing those 10 children. Now, later on, he got more children now. But it wasn't like he could replace the ones that died. But Job had to learn a lesson. It was a harsh lesson. And it had to go directly to his greatest fear. And brothers and sisters, that's why I say to you, I've learned that. I've learned that. It took me a long time. And I'm still learning, but I'm just I'm conveying to you what Father has shown to me. Give all your fears to Father. The worst thing in the world that you think could happen to you, give it to your father and, and overcome it so that it's not a fear anymore. That's not saying you want bad things to happen, but you don't want Asatan to hold anything over your head. You hear what I'm saying? You don't want him to hold, because any fear you have, he will hold it over your head and get you to do whatever. See, and, 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 you know, people will do, people will do a lot of things. Their children or somebody gets kidnapped. They will go through all kind of rigmarole just to save them because they're scared. And I totally understand that. But we, we're at a time in earth's history and brothers and sisters, we, we got, we, we're talking about the 144,000. That ain't no, this is no cakewalk. Being sealed as among the 144,000 is no cakewalk. That's 144,000 versions of Job is what we're dealing with. 144,000 versions of Job. The, great, the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. That which I was afraid of is happening to me. I was not in safety, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Brothers and sisters, I'm just being real with you. I'm not trying to scare you, I honestly am not. Trouble is coming. And we got to be fortified against the trouble in the Father's spirit and in his grace. And his grace is much more powerful than any of our fears. I'm just trying to tell you, his grace is much more powerful than any of our fears. It really is. I'm being honest with you. 
And this ain't got nothing to do with going to no daggone building and jumping up and down in no daggone pew from some stupid pastor. Ain't got nothing to do with that. This is real. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is when you got to swallow hard and stand firm. You hear what I'm saying? This ain't no BS. This is where you got to swallow hard and stand firm. We're getting into that right now. That's why I say to you, it takes prayer. It takes fasting. It takes a complete commitment. Not to me. And that's what I'm saying. That's what the beauty of this thing is not to me. It's not to any camp. It's not to any church. It's directly to Father. Directly to Father. It takes a complete commitment to Father. He will honor your commitment. He will honor that. It's not about your money. See, that's a cop-out. Money's really a cop-out. To be able to scratch off a check or give a couple of dollars to somebody, that ain't nothing. <laughs> that, you know what I'm saying? That ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. I mean, it could be nice. You know, somebody needs some stuff and whatever, and you can give it to them. That's nice. That's all right. We're talking about soul commitment. You see, brothers and sisters, the Jesuits of the Roman Catholic Church have a commitment to Rome. They're willing to go through starvation and death and suffering for the glory of the Pope. Did you know that? They're under an oath. The Jesuits are under an oath where they are ready to suffer. And that's why, you know, despite what you hear about on the earth, the Jews run the money. Okay, the Ashkenazis run the money. The Queen and those people in the Bilderberg group, they, they, they have power. But all of them are subject to the Pope. And do you know why? Because of what the devil says, skin for skin, all that a man have, he'll give for his life. All of these rich people, all these powerful people, listen carefully. They all scared of death. And the Jesuits are committed unto death for the Pope. That's why the Bible said that the mark of the beast can be given in the right hand or in the forehead, whereas the seal of Yah is only in the forehead. What does that mean? When you got a mark in your forehead, you are completely given over to that spirit. So the Jesuits are willing to suffer poverty and death. They're, they're suffering pennilessness, homelessness, whatever. And that's why the Bilderbergs, the Ashkenazis, all of these people understand if a Jesuit needs to kill you and your family, they will do it without thinking twice for the glory of their Pope. And so just so on the other side, here we are, and we have to be willing to sacrifice all for the glory of Yah, for his spirit. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that's true of no exaggeration. The spirit of the father is not even worthy to be compared to the spirit of these people out here giving themselves to the Pope. It's not even willing to be compared. Come on. Father got grace, man. A brother can be burning to death and he'll sit there singing. He could be sitting there burning to death, skin melting off him, and he'll sing a hymn. That's the power of the grace of the Father. The Apostle Paul, they had to take him away into the wilderness to behead him because everybody that saw that brother, the way he was handling that business, he was not only not scared to die, even the executioner was getting converted. So they had to take him into the wilderness where nobody could see it. That's how powerful the grace of Yah is, man. Don't you worry about these people. Okay. So now we understand that the righteousness of the Father is made manifest as the faith of Messiah. The righteousness of the Father is made manifest as the testimony of the Messiah or the witness of Messiah. And that we keep commandments of Yah by his spirit, which is manifest in those things. Everybody got that, right? Testing one, two, three. Do I need to go over it again? You all got it. You all got it? At least for now, right? I know we all dull of mind and we might forget, but I just want you. Okay, good. Praise the most high, Yah. Now let's get into Zechariah. Now I did all that background to get us to Zechariah. Watch this now, Zechariah chapter one. Now we know already read from verses one through 10. So let's start, I'm gonna start at verse 10. And I'm gonna go down to verse from 10 to 16 to start off. Zechariah chapter one from 10 to 16. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees, so Zechariah saw a man standing among the myrtle trees. 
answered and said, these are they whom Yahweh have sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered, and the angel of Yahweh that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel of Yahweh answered and said, O Yahweh of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? And Yahweh answered the angel that talked with me with good words and with comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for, Ju and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, and my house shall be built in it, saith Yahweh of hosts, and a line shall be stretched upon Jerusalem. Let's stop here. So an angel was a sitting among trees. And the angel, and you'll see this, you saw this also in Daniel chapter 8, angels talk with Yahweh in the presence of the prophet, like they're having this conversation and they want the prophet to hear the conversation. So angels might be talking to each other, they might be talking to Yah, but the prophet is listening. See, it happened in Isaiah. Remember, the Most High said, um, who shall I send to warn these people? He's talking like to the angels. And then Isaiah says, here I am, send me, right? And then two angels speaking, and, and Daniel's listening to him and say, how long shall it be until, until the desolation, the abomination that make it desolate, it, it, it be done? And he said, until 2,300 days, and Daniel's listening. So that's what happens, brother and sister, you understand? So here, there's an angel talking, and Yah's talking to the angel, and Zechariah's listening. And he said, how long, you know, you've had indignation against your people for 70 years. How long before you start? And then Yah answered him, the Bible said, with comfortable, with comfortable words. In other words, he's encouraging him. In other words, it's going to come to an end soon. And though, I want you to notice verse 15, though. He said, I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. What does that mean? This is very important, brothers and sisters. I want to make sure y'all hear this one. This is very important. So in other words, Yah uses the heathen to punish his people. We already know that, right? He uses the heathen to punish his people. Okay? And so when he's displeased with his people, he uses the heathen. He used Babylon. He used Egypt. He used the sons of Yafet, right? He used the Arabs to punish his people for, for you know, for the sins of our father. But then he said, he said, but now I'm displeased with the heathen. He said, yeah, I use you to punish my people, but you're taking it too far. That's what he said. He said, you held forward the affliction. In other words, you done gone off the rails. Y'all done took it too far. And that's what we're seeing now. The heathen done gone off the rails. They done took it too far. They're out now trying to destroy us. Now, I want you all to understand very plainly. You cannot destroy that which Yah has ordained to survive. Okay? I mean, Haman tried it in, 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 in Medes and the Persians. He tried it. It didn't work out too well for him. The Egyptians tried it. Didn't work out too well for them. Right? So you cannot destroy that which Yah has ordained. And Yah has ordained for his people to not only survive, but to awaken and to become, you know, to become heads of this kingdom. He's already ordained that. So the more they try with their Margaret Sangers, with their, with their, with their, with their drugs to try to cause our boys to be homosexuals and our girls to be lesbians and the stuff they put in the water, the more they try with their sterilization programs, the more they try to put us in herds and to, into ghettos and put heroin in there and to put crack cocaine in there, the more they try, we are not going anywhere. And you could already see it. They tried their best. They tried their best. They first they brought us over here as chain enslaved. Do you know that the average slave only lived to be 25 years old? That's as old as they, they got before they were worked literally to death. In in, in South America it was even 20, it was younger, it was 21. 
They tried their best to kill us until we was disposed. But we survived. Matter of fact, all it did was make us stronger. That's all it did. And I'm talking about not only spiritually stronger, but physically stronger. It got to the point where they would kill Indians because the Hebrews that came from West Africa was just stronger. Made us stronger. That's why, why do you think today the greatest athletes are, 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 are Hebrew? I'm, am I lying? The greatest sprinters? Now, you might get a Caucasian pop out every once in a while and be great. I'm not saying that can't happen. But, you know, by and large, the greatest, strongest, fastest, powerful athletes are Hebrew. Why? Because we don't survive. That's why. They tried to kill us, and all we did was get stronger. All we did was get stronger. We're not going nowhere. And it's because Yah has ordained it. You can't turn back the word of Yah. It's going to prosper in the thing which he pleases. It's going to prosper where he sent. And he has ordained for us to survive. You're going to bring forth a remnant. You can't kill it. See, that's why I don't worry about, the brothers and sisters, you might have heard about these FEMA camps, right? And you heard about how they planning on killing us. Don't you worry about none of that. I don't care what they do. It don't matter how many dungeons they build. I don't care what their plans are for you, brothers and sisters. We are ordained to survive. Okay? We not the Ashkenazis. We not them. We not suffering no daggone holocaust. That's their problem. That's them and their cousins killing them. That ain't got nothing to do with us. Uh-uh. We've been going through thousands of years of this mess, and here we are. We still here. Here we are. We still here. And most recently, the 1960s, they brought heroin. They created, you know what they did? They created a brand new housing system in the 60s and 50s, public housing. It was all clean. If you were old enough, you remember, back in the day, the public housing projects used to be the place to be, man. It was clean, man. It was clean. They had new fences. They kept it manicured. It was all good. If you remember, I remember. It was clean. Them projects, and then all of a sudden, the Vietnam War came. And then they start brothers coming back hooked on heroin. Then they put heroin in there. Then they took away services from the projects. They took away public service. They stopped picking up the garbage when they were supposed to. They started putting liquor stores in the neighborhoods. They start making our men not get good jobs, denying us opportunities, making it depressing. Then it started getting ugly. Okay. We survived it though. Then they said, okay, we got to step up our game. Then they, they created this thing called crack. Huh? They created crack. Wiped out a whole generation of young boys. I remember, man, in the 1980s, I can't tell you how many teenage burials and funerals there was in the 1980s based on wars over crack. But here we are. Then they got scared, right? Because we still survived that. We still survived that. And then they brought out the three strike laws. Said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to lock them up. We're going to get tough on crime. That's what they came. That was the that was code for let's kill all the Hebrews. We're going to get tough on crime. Here we, we still here. We still here. And then they brought out methamphetamine and they brought out crystal meth. And you know what happened? They people started getting hooked on that mess. They own people started getting hooked on that. And they own people killing themselves now. You know why? Because it's ordained that we're going to survive. You know why? Because Yah has ordained that we're going to be awakened. That's why. And when Yah puts forth the word, there's nothing nobody can do about it. And if you keep persisting, see, they don't went too far. They help forward the affliction. They still doing it. They can't help themselves because you know what? They don't really see. I'm not talking about all Caucasians because this Caucasians listen to me right now. That believe in y'all. Some of y'all are baptized. So, you know, I'm not talking about all Caucasians, but yet y'all understand that the majority of Caucasians, they don't believe in the most high y'all. You know, I'm telling the truth. They go to church and everything, but it's formality. When it come down to it, when it come down to it, they go for self. They go for self. And self ain't going to help them. Self ain't going to help them. And they're very scared. Very scared. They got opioid epidemic now. They got, they got, they got the, the young girls getting pregnant early, right? The, 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 the young girls using that crystal meth, huh? Right? I'm not, I'm not lying. You know, I'm in, the, in middle America. That's what's happening right now. 
They struggling. They own Caucasian leaders that they trusted in, taking away their jobs, sending them to Mexico, sending the jobs to the Philippines, sending the jobs to China, dogging their own people. It's already happening, man. It's right here. This is just judgment beginning. Then, then you already seeing the hurricane, the earthquake, the fire. You already seeing it. I ain't telling you nothing that you ain't seen already. Okay, it's already happening. Why? Because the tide is turning. It's already turning. See, people don't see it right now, but when you when you st when you with the most high, you can see it. The tide is beginning to turn. The awakening is happening. The awakening of the Hebrew is the death knell of Satan's kingdom, and he knows it. But you know what? There's nothing he could do about it. That's why what he's doing right now, he's bringing forth all these entertainers. He's bringing forth these people. He's uplifting these black entertainers, making you think they're gods. Oh, you could be like this. Oh, you could get as much money as them. Oh, you could be like J-Lo. Oh, you could be like, you could be like LeBron. You could do it. Shoot for that. No, nah, don't shoot for that. It's a smoke screen. Stick with the righteousness of the father. Forget your churches. Churches ain't going to help you. Churches ain't going to help them. It's not helping them. We said it before. We say it again. If Christianity was really helping us, we wouldn't be in this mess. If Christianity was real, we wouldn't have to march in the streets for no rights to be citizen. Do Polish people have to come here and march in the streets to be citizen? Do Italian people have to come here from Italy and march in the streets to be citizen? Do English people have to come here? Do German people have to come here? Huh? Do, do, do Irish people have to come here and march in the streets to be citizens? Do they? No. Well, how come we who were brought here in chains have to march in the street to be citizens? You know why? Because this ain't our place. We, we, that's not our God. This ain't got nothing to do with us. But the tide is turning. And I don't care how many skinheads they get. I don't care how many AK-47s they stack up. I don't care how many they'll go out there in the country's rednecks out here. I don't care what they do. I don't care how many Confederate flags they fly. It's not going to help them. It's not going to help them. Not going to help them. It's not. I'm just being honest. It's just not going to help. Okay. And it ain't because it ain't because we just so much more powerful. It's our God. It's not, it's not us. It's him. See, Pharaoh was looking at the Hebrews, but it wasn't the, the Hebrews wasn't his problem. It was the Hebrews' God that was his problem. <laughs> it was the Hebrews' God that was his problem. Moses was sure with that dead on rod in his hand and said, let my people go. And he knew right there there was going to be trouble, right? He knew right there there was going to be trouble. Got to the point where his, his, his Mizraim brethren said, man, you better let these people go. Don't you see all of Egypt is destroyed? Moses showed up with his brother Aaron and they got that rod in his hand. Pharaoh know there's problems coming. See, it ain't them, it's their God. And that's the same thing now. Always going to be that. So they took it too far. He said, I'm very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction. They don't went too far. Remember that, Zechariah 115, next time the heathen said, well, I, I never had a slave. I, I, I've never been prejudiced. I, I don't see colors. Liar, 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 liar. Every Caucasian on, in the United States of America is benefiting from what y'all did to us. You benefiting. If you breathe in this air, you benefiting. If you standing on this side, you benefiting. And all we need from you is one thing, repentance. That's all we need. I don't, don't want to hear no excuse, hamina, hamina, about what you didn't do, about you, how you never did. You better repent. That's all we're saying to you. You better bow your knees and repent, brother, sister. That's all we're saying to you. I don't want to hear none of your excuse. You know why? Because when your is standing with his sword drawn like he was with Joshua, he's going to come back again. The Bible says in righteousness, he's a judge and make war. <laughs> he ain't going to want to hear your excuse that day. He's not. He's not. He's not having it. He's not having it. Better come correct now. Now is the time. That's all we're saying. Now is the time. It's about all love right now. It's about all love and grace. We're trying to tell you. We're trying to warn you. Like Noah warned the people. Like Moses warned Pharaoh. Right? We're trying to tell you. 144,000 trying to say, this is it, man. Turn from this. 
listen, your game is up. Your system is about to be overthrown. We just read it. He said, I'm going to overthrow the whole system. I'm going to overthrow it. It ain't us. We're not gathering no weapons. We're not out here taking target practice like these rednecks out here with, 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 with Confederate facts about taking our country back. You better, you better, y'all better wake up. It's about to be over and your guns are not going to save you. This is about spirit, man. This is about spirit. Zechariah chapter 1 from verse 16 and verse 17. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Watch very closely now. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith Yahweh of hosts, and, the, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet spread abroad, and Yahweh shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. See, he has not forgotten who his people are. His people have messed up. There's no question. We done messed up bad. We worship all kind of stars and moon and astrology. We done turned up and messed up and, 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 and we backstabbed Messiah himself. We did it. We did it. And he has punished us sore, man. Punished us bad. Many, many centuries of punishment. We had it coming. But he ain't forgot who we are. He ain't forgot who he is. He's and he says he's measuring. Where did we see that before? Remember we saw it in Revelation chapter 11. He said, take a line and measure the temple and them that worship therein. He said, but the court leave out. That's given to the Gentiles. Remember that? Revelation chapter 11. What is the measuring line? Measuring line represents the line that is measured against perfect righteousness. Why do I say that? Well, you know, when you get ready to build something, when builders get ready to build something, what they do? They measure it. They measure it. They make sure it's balanced. They make sure it's according to specifications. Isn't that correct? So when you're measuring Jerusalem, what you're doing is according to specifications. What's the specification? Perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness is the measurement. Is it, is it measuring up? Is it right? He said, I'm going to yet choose Jerusalem. I'm going to put a line and stretch it upon Jerusalem. I'm returned with mercies. You see, brothers and sisters, the heathen trying to destroy us. But the more they try to destroy us, the more now the father saying, okay, it's time for grace to my people. It's time for me to wake up my people and bring the grace to them. That's what's going on. And he's only allowing us to continue to suffer to awaken us. Some people just ain't got that memo yet. But that's what he's trying to do. That's what he's doing. Now look at this chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, Zechariah chapter 1, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, then lifted I up my eyes and saw, and behold, wait, wait, four horns, and I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Huh? Now, at the time, now, horn, rep, if you look up the word horn, it represents a point of power. That's what horn represents. If you look it up in the Hebrew, it represents a point of power. Okay? That's what horn represents. That's why, and even in Revelation in the New Testament, it said the beast had seven heads and what? Ten horns, ten points of power. It said it had ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. Ten points of power, which you're going to receive. Kind of, and okay, so the Bible says, Yah is my rock. He is the horn of my salvation, right? The power of my salvation. So he said these four powers represent the powers that scatter Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, we know who the four powers are, don't we? We already know. Zechariah didn't know yet, but he would find out. But we already know who they are because we didn't study Daniel, right? Who are the four powers that scattered Judah? And Israel and Jerusalem. Who are the four powers? Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and finally Rome. Those are the four powers. Okay? Everybody got me? Those are the four powers. They scatter 
Jerusalem and Judah. And the last one being Rome is the most ruthless and cruel of all. That's why they brought up the Jesuit order. Like I said, the Jesuit order have the mark in their foreheads. They are not afraid to die for their cause. They will die penniless. They will die hump. They will die by suicide. They do whatever they need to do to, to further the cause of the Pope of Rome. That's what you're dealing with now. Okay, that's why all other powers, don't listen to people that are telling you the Jews are the ones that are running things. No, them Ashkenazis are scared for their life. The Jesuits are not. Okay, the Jesuits are not. They are completely given over to the Pope of Rome. And it has to be that way. Asatan has to have an army that's completely given over to his will. And Father has an army that's completely given over to his will. And so the four powers are Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And the last one is Rome. And he's, not, again, remember we talked about this. There's been a lot of kingdoms on the earth. The Greek Empire, of course. I mean, there's the British Empire. The Germans had an empire. The Chinese had many dynasties. There's been many empires in Africa and the various nations of Africa. Many empires in India. Many empires. But why does he pick these four? Notice what it said. Because these have scattered Judah, Israel, in Jerusalem. That's why. See? His, the apple of his eye is Judah and Israel. That's the apple of his eye. Okay? We're going to see that in the next chapter. But the apple of his eye is Judah and Israel. And that's why he, he talks about these four, the last of which being the Pope of Rome, which which of which out of which come Christianity, out of which come the slavery of the mind and spirit that we have been suffering for several hundred years, but we're now being set free from. Zechariah chapter one. I'm going to start again at verse 19. Only this time I'm going to read down to verse 21, which is finishing the chapter. Zechariah chapter one from verse 19 to verse 21. Notice what it says. Zechariah 19. I'm excuse me. Zechariah chapter one from 19 to 21. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And Yahweh showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them and to cast them out cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter them. So the Most High is going to have four carpenters that come. Remember also, he had angels that did what? Held back what? Four winds. Remember that? He said, hold the winds till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And notice the winds are for the Gentiles to cast out of the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah. So as the Gentiles have lifted up their power against the Israelite people, the Yah's true people, as they have lifted up their power to oppress and to try to destroy, now the four winds are being prepared. And they're only being held back until the 144,000 are sealed. And when they are let loose, total destruction is going to come upon this earth. The plagues are going to come strong on this earth. And the heathen are going to be going crazy. We're not going to be going crazy. Why? Number one, because we already know it's coming. We're not surprised. We already know it's coming. Number two, because we're in the spirit of the Father's grace. And he will keep us during that time. Final scripture. The final scripture for today. Proverbs 18.10. Proverbs 18.10, the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10, the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Safety is of Yah. Safety is not in chains, it's not in bars of iron, it's not in walls, it's not in countries. Safety is of the Most High Yah. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Storm is coming, brothers and sisters, but don't worry. They that dwell under the shower of the wings of the Almighty. Wait, wait. They that dwell in the secret place of the Almighty, they that dwell in the secret place of Yah shall 
be under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. Let me say it right. Let me say that right. I don't want to mess it up. Um, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's it. That's it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow. I lied to you. This is the last verse. He that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will save you how well. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Praise the Most High. Yeah, that's right. Believe that, brothers and sisters. Learn to believe those words. Trust your God. Your God is the creator of all things. There is none like him. There is no power that he can't overcome. Don't worry about anything else. Trust him. Trust your God. You see why it's important that we overcome such false doctrines, such as Trinity, because you know now there's one God, your father, and you know that's who you have to trust. Doesn't that make it very simple? Doesn't that make it very simple and straightforward, doesn't it? You don't have to trust in three gods. You trust in one, your father. He sent you Messiah to help you, to be an example unto you, to give you his spirit. That's why he gave you Messiah. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Let's have a word of prayer. Most High Yahweh, we are so grateful. We are so thankful. We are so extremely privileged to be called your children. Not that we deserve such a title, but your grace through Messiah Yahweh Shah makes it possible. And we only ask today that you would please cause your spirit to dwell within us in a way that we would bring honor and glory to your most holy name. In the name of Messiah Yahweh Shah, we pray. Amen. Praise the Most High Yah. Turn off the stage. Praise Yah. Any questions?